Can you hear me? A little bit. Um, in your in your bulletin, it shows that I am the speaker this morning. But however, um, that's a, a little mistake I've made. Even though the title of the sermon is right, um, the speaker this morning uh, is uh, the lady at my left. Uh, her name is uh, Saza Pass. Um, Saza is the administrative assistant at uh, Really Living Center Seventh Day Adventist Church in uh, in Canada, uh, in Hamilton, Ontario, and um, she um, she comes to us to talk about uh, how can our church be a center of influence in our community. Uh, that's her main main topic, and. Uh, there's uh, recently there's been uh, quite a few churches that have taken this approach, and uh, and so I, um, her church and her pastor are friends of mine, and and, and uh, I've, uh, you know, a while ago I decided I asked her uh, to come to speak, and so this was this Easter weekend was a good Sabbath for her to come and her husband, her uh, Tino, sitting right here, and um, even though um, they're their names his his uh he's from the philippines and uh i um when i would introduce he uh, let me tell you how i met these these wonderful people this wonderful couple uh a while ago when i was uh, assisting in mission trips in ecuador they uh i would welcome uh, they would the each mission team would do two visits uh to the country the first one it was only the leaders and uh and so they were the leaders of the mission team from their church and so, uh, you know, it, I would make friends and get to know these people because I was spending all day with them. Uh, but this couple, this, this couple was particularly uh, fun to be around. Uh, they were particularly, we, we bonded very nicely. And uh, I realized that every time, uh, you know, we went, I, I, one thing I needed to do to keep uh, Tino happy was, was just to make sure that there was good food. And so that, that wasn't a problem in Ecuador. And so we made sure that... We, we kind of plan our trips around uh, good, good places to eat, you know, and, uh, and they, they weren't very picky uh, in terms of, you know, uh, they had to be, you know, they were, they were fine eating our local food and prepared by local people. They were just fine with it. They, they didn't get sick. They were good. So um, anyways, uh, just to give you a little bit more of a background of, uh, of Saza, um, what, what ended up happening is that Saza saw me uh, assisting in mission trips and also pastoring as a single as a single pastor, and so uh, I think I really believe that God impressed her uh, to uh, look me with eyes of I don't know if mercy pity, uh, <laughs> and uh, she said I I I really feel that I should introduce this this young man to 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 somebody I know, and she introduced me to Amy. And uh, so uh, now, now you understand <laughs> uh, that I and you know I'm here now. So um, this this uh, this couple is a very godly couple. I've come to enjoy their friendship uh, and and their 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 spiritual walk. And over during this this time that uh, since I've met met them, I've seen them both grow, especially. Uh, outside of go outside of their comfort zones in terms of reaching out to their neighbors to their community to people that don't know Jesus and I don't know if you know much about Canada but I'm, I, I've learned that Canada is a very uh, increasingly secular place uh, and and it's 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 uh, it's very liberal in certain sense and uh, and so you know it's just people that haven't grown up with Protestant Christianity or, or Catholic for that matter and so, uh, you know, friendships and 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 being a center of influence for church is is is, is perhaps the the only way to go and and to reaching out to the lost, and uh, and so, uh, I, you know, every time I talk to her, she's on a, on a new thing that she's doing with her church, uh, trying to uh, to do that precisely to reach out to uh, the community and those around them. And uh, bringing a new new guests, new people, uh, to to uh, into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and at the same time, uh, you know, she's not forgotten about uh, the people 
and that her church has not forgotten about the people outside of Canada. And so since, uh, since Ecuador, they decided they've done two other mission trips. Yeah, they've done two other mission trips to the Dominican Republic and another one to, um, uh, to Peru recently. And so she'll tell you a little bit more about those things. And uh, without uh, further ado, I'd, uh, I'll leave you with the speaker of this morning, Saza Paz. Good morning, church. Thank you for welcoming me here. It's been such a privilege to be here and meeting all of you as well. As Danny said, I am the administrative assistant of um, Really Living Seventh-day Adventist Church in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, um, formerly known as Living Word Christian Fellowship. Um, as Danny, Pastor Danny was saying, we met Pastor Danny on, on my first mission trip that I organized um, through Maranatha Volunteers International as well. And Amy and her family are very good friends of ours. Just to give you a little bit of a background, um, we have two children, and we homeschooled our children from kindergarten up to grade eight, and after that they went to public school, and after they were graduated from high school, they went to Andrews University. That's where we actually met Amy and her family as well. Um, my husband and I, we both had kind of an unconventional walk with God as well. He grew up Catholic and I grew up Christian Reformed. And when we dated, we ended up going to the Catholic Church. Um, but eventually we were led to the Baptist Church where we really fell in love and met our Lord and Savior. And we got baptized there. In 1995, a crusade through Leo Screven came to our town and we learned more biblical truths and we got rebaptized through the Adventist Church as well. Um, come to think of it, my husband and I, since we actually started in the Baptist Church, we didn't have a chance to be inactive. We were part of a startup church in Hamilton, a Baptist Church in Hamilton. Then when we came to the Adventist Church, we basically helped out wherever help was needed as well. Um, the pastor at that time, because the mother church basically grew up so exponentially, we had to build another church. And he approached us and asked us to be part of a new church that he wanted to plant um, that focuses basically on small groups. Um, it would be a prototype church because we were the first church in Canada that would focus on small groups. Um, so, hence, Living Word Christian Fellowship came into existence about 17 years ago, where we would try to invite people to come to our small groups. Seems easy enough, didn't it? It wasn't. We tried to do party events, barbecues, but we weren't successful. But um, the small groups were very successful in that sense that we became really close with one another. We really learned to care for one another. We prayed for one another, and we were just there for one another. It wasn't just that we just came to church on Sabbath and the rest of the week we weren't in contact with each other. It really, be, we really became a close-knit group. Um, come to think of it, I think also the reason is that we were too intent on preaching the gospel to people we just met. We wanted them to be saved. Isn't that everybody's longing here? But I think we do it wrong. Um, because instead of building friendships with them and spending time with them and waiting, the main thing is waiting on the Holy Spirit's leading. We are not in the saving business. God is. And in short, we were doing this by our works. And I think that's why we were not successful. Fast forward a few years later, um, we got another pastor, Francis Duville, who also believed in small groups and especially outreach in the community through small groups. That really changed our outlook on things. Our pastor challenged each small group to do an act of kindness uh, for single moms, especially in the community. That was the first year that he came in. All the groups, I can tell you, they were stumped. We had no idea what to do. And this just shows you how sheltered and inward focused we were we didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to go. Um, our pastor actually was very involved in a church back then um, in British Columbia where they do a lot of outreach. And one of the main things that he did was um, uh, restore homes for families in need out in British Columbia. That's actually a big thing right now um, at the church there in British Columbia. 
some of the initial outreach we did in our small group was to help a single mom move. We met this lady while my mom was in the hospital and she was my mom's roommate. And she was sharing with my husband and I that she had no one to help her. Um, her kids lived far away, she had no family. So we decided as a small group to help her move. And so this is one of the pictures. I have to try to figure out how to work this. Um, yeah, thank you. So this is, you know, we, we had a little, um, I guess a little trolley there, and so we loaded everything up for her and we helped her, and she was just so thankful. Um, another thing we did is we met a family on Kijiji, which is kind of like Craigslist, and she was asking for help for during Christmas time because she was in need of things for clothing and stuff for her children. So we decided to adopt this family as well. And at Christmas time, we got together, we brought lunch over, and we just had fellowship with her and her family. Um, one another group, what they did was um, they actually bought roses on Mother's Day, and they went house to house, and they knocked on each door and handed a single rose to each mom at that house. And as a result, actually, one of the ladies that received a rose, um, she decided to wanted to have Bible study and got baptized as well. Yes. So every year, our pastor challenged all the groups uh, to do an act of kindness. Sometimes um, the church would give us seed money, and we would have to give a testimony how to grow the seed money. So it's not just giving a, you know, each small group would get $100, and we have to try to grow it. Uh, so, and every year you see that the small groups were growing in participation as well with these small, with these acts of kindness. Now, our small groups were all sermon-based. We talked about the sermon that was preached on each Sabbath, and we talked about it, how we can apply it in our lives. This is not a Bible study. We try to make it as friendly as possible because you always have to keep it in mind that if you want to invite a friend that has no knowledge about Jesus Christ, you want to make it friendly for them, that, they, that relates to them as well. We had several visitors come to our small group, but for some reason, they didn't stick. And um, we're still trying to figure out how to make it more attractive as well to our church members. But we, to this day, we do have five groups that are quite active. We have our seniors group, and they are incredible. They have been knitting hats for our homeless ministry, for the homeless people downtown. They go and attend, go to nursing homes as well, and visit the shut-ins as well. So they've been really, really active, and um, so that's their ministry, what they do. Our small groups, what we do is we, um, we don't, we do small groups, it's not all year long. We might have three sessions, which each session is about maybe six to eight weeks. We take a two-week break, and we do another six to eight weeks, and summertime we take a break for the summer as well. Now our church really living, is in the process of building our own church. It has been a very long process, born of big dreams, to have a space that would make a difference in the community. Our mission is to embrace our community with the Adventist message of hope and wholeness. In short, we wanted to build a center of influence. Have you guys heard of center of influence? Does anybody know what it is? Um, it's a concept actually that comes from Mrs. White who had a vision to establish small plants in urban areas which shall be centers of influence. They are basically holistic ministry centers to connect the church to the needs of your community. The principle is to connect with people's needs. It is our vision to be a Christ-focused center for teaching and healing of mind, body, and soul. There are so many ways to reach your city or a city farther away for Christ from praying to volunteering to starting a center of influence, opportunities await. We are told, um, next slide here. We are told, we are not, this is a quote by Mrs. White as well. We are not to wait for souls to come to us. We must seek them out where they are. When the word has been preached in the pulpit, the work has just begun. There are multitudes who will never be reached by the gospel unless it is carried to them. Now, it doesn't have to be complicated. Jesus' approach was very simple. The Savior mingled with man as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them 
ministered to their needs and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. So currently we are building a center of influence which will be called Really Living Center. And our church, Really Living Seventh-day Adventist Church, will hold its services at the Really Living Center. Here's an example that I wanted to show you that is a center of influence in Quebec, um, Canada. They hold their cooking classes there, they have art classes there, because one of the members is a very gifted artist as well. Um, they have health classes, and um, they are quite successful in their community as well. I met a lady who is from Quebec here, I don't know where she is. There you are. Yes, and you probably know that in Quebec, um, it's even more secular there. People are not open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But through these centers of influence, they are. And they have been very successful in reaching out. Also, because just we have been renting our church. But just because we don't have our own building yet, that doesn't mean that we cannot do outreach events in our community. Some of the things that we do as a church in our community are... We do an oil change for single moms. We do this twice a year where do we do a free oil change and free car detailing. This is actually our next one is coming up on May 7th as well. Um, we connect with local garages and some of them have donated all the oils and all the filters as well. We only allow up to 20 people to register as well. So just you know that it's not gonna be hundreds and hundreds of people coming in as well. Another outreach we have is, so here are some of the people that are washing the car. Actually, Tino is washing the car there. And some of our young people are actually come vacuuming, and they're really helping out, like some of the 10-year-olds were just really helping out there. Another outreach we have is called the Gift Club for Kids, where, for example, at Christmas time, some families from the community in need come over to our church. We work with a local organization who pick out the families and the children. As they come, a host, which is a member of our church, will meet them and lead them to a table where some of our members are sitting. And we basically interact with one another. We have a light luncheon together, and we do crafts together, and um, the gym is all decorated as well. And then the children from our church actually bring the children from the community around and they can pick out a gift for their siblings and their mom and dad. So that at Christmas time, they have a gift to give for their families. Um, we also serve the homeless people downtown in Hamilton. Um, this started actually as an outreach from our little small group as well. But now it has grown that we do this twice a month and we basically feed them right on the street in the winter time as well in the summer time. We feed about 200 people a night when we, uh, when we go out there. Um, we work with local grocery stores and um, we get quite a lot of donations as well. And actually one of the health food stores cooks the chili for us once a month for us as well. It is a band-aid, but you know, um, it's just for people to know that we care um, they pray with us, right? They allow us to pray with them right on the street as well. And it's been, a, it's been such a privilege as well to meet these people. We also have our, um, so this is one of them where one of our young people is serving the homeless as well. Um, so you see, see the line up here, it's in the evening. It starts at eight o'clock. We don't get home until midnight usually. Um, we have also a cooking class that I just held in February. And we do this intentionally very small. I only allow six people um, from the community to attend this, and we do this over a period of three weeks. It's a hands-on cooking class, as you can see, and we just enjoy being with each other and really just develop friendships with them. At the end of the three weeks, I invited them to come over to my place and invited them for a potluck lunch. And till now, we still continue to be in touch with each other and just develop friendships. The big thing that we do, so here's where we're cooking, we're eating together. Big thing, another big thing is the active living boot camp. We hired a personal trainer and we rented a gym at the school. So twice a week for eight weeks, we have a free exercise program. And on Sabbaths, they are invited to come and walk with some of the members of our church as well. 
Um, this has been very successful and about 50 people already registered. That's coming up on May 9th, I believe. Another thing, as, so this is the group that um, did the exercise program last time. Another thing we did as a church is collecting canned goods for the local food bank. This is a really easy thing that you can do as a church, and the children especially love that. We, we give out flyers to the community, and they know what they were coming, and the children knock on the door, and usually most people give out canned goods, and we just drop it off at the local food bank. We get together, and the local food bank know we're coming, and it's usually during a time when they're really in need, when the donations are really low at that time. Basically, at the core of our values is the desire to be a church that serves both in our local community and around the world. Now, our church has always done mission trips on a regular basis. It first started with the youth pastor, bringing the children and youth on a mission trip. The youth group has gone to Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. After the youth pastor left and our current senior pastor came in, I requested if I could lead out a mission trip. I chose Maranatha Volunteers International simply because of the fact that they are a very well-run organization. And for the first time, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't too complicated to run it and organize it. Through prayers, it was decided that we needed to go to Ecuador to build one-day churches. Have you guys heard of one-day churches? So it's just basically, yeah, you just built a structure in one day. And we did five structures in that, in that time period, and that's, as Dan, Pastor Danny was saying, that's where we met him. And we are just so thankful to Pastor Danny who's been there for us. And he, and, uh, he just became a very close friend of ours. And, and you see the result. Him and Amy are married now, which I'm so thankful for. So 11 of, um, we had a group of 11 people that came on, on this group as well. Let me hear forward here. So this was in Ecuador where we built, and we had a couple of, um, uh, young people that came on this trip. And we did all fundraising through the church, and we raised about $25,000 to go towards the churches. Um, you have to remember that even though we built a structure, each church in Ecuador had to still come up with money for the blocks, the flooring, everything, pews, everything. So we decided we wanted to raise that as well. During the day, this is actually when the church was, the structure was finished and we had our Sabbath, our Sabbath worship there underneath the structure. Um, in the evening, we did basically a vacation Bible school for the children there as well. People in Ecuador were so incredible, like so hospitable and so loving to us and we were, we were really spoiled there. Our second mission trip was held in Dominican Republic. Again, we worked with Maranata volunteers, and the people in the DR, they met underneath a tarp, and this was their church for about three years. Um, we worked on just one structure, and but we built the blocks as well. And this time, 16 of us went, and we fundraised again through the church. In the evening, our pastor did a creation health service, and in the, um, we did a vacation Bible school as well. We also did a community um, project on the first Sabbath. We were there through an impoverished area. This is our, actually our pastor who was working hard blocking, and this is us when we were basically almost done blocking the church. So this is the VBS. Um, so we went through an impoverished area there as well on that first Sabbath, and we handed out beans and rice and all necessities for the people there in that area, and we invited them to come to a um, health expo that we had later on in the afternoon, on that Sabbath afternoon. Um, we handed out toothbrushes and toothpaste. We did, we had a little clinic for eyesight as well. So people that didn't have reading glasses, that they were able to get reading glasses. And we did also a, um, um, a blood pressure test as well. We worked together with the local nurses and doctors as well. So the, they promised that they would follow up with these local people as well after we left. Now, 2016 was the year that we were, which was last year, was supposed to be, so this was actually, sorry, but this was actually the health expo. About over 200, no, 400 people, right, you know, showed up. It was, it was packed. Yeah, it was packed. 
2016 was the year that we were supposed to have another mission trip again. But we had decided to forego a trip because of the expenses of building our new facility. But God's plans are always better than our plans. Through a chance encounter at a lineup at a grocery store, I befriended um, a couple. The husband, who is an avid traveler, found out about our humanitarian trips and really wanted to go. A contractor was actually working on our home for renovations. He also got interested. We invited him, and he wanted to go and also invited another friend of his. One lady on social media contacted me. I had no idea who she was, but I posted something about mission trips, and she contacted me and asked me if her daughter and her friend can come as well. So we had five people from the community that were excited in coming on a mission trip. God impressed it on my heart that I needed to do a mission trip in Peru. Um, also because of the concept of center of influence, it also changed my whole perspective on mission trips. I see them now as using these as reaching out to our community and inviting them to come. The way we did it was to have regular meetings at our place and we cooked a meal for them and we just had fellowship with them and we did it very regularly. And because of that, we became really good friends with them and their families. And until now, they are really still good friends and we still get together um, on a regular basis. And we just plant seeds and just love them. Through prayer, I decided to fly solo and not go through an organization this time. God was so good and he planned and blessed this whole trip from the beginning. I had no idea where to go, who to contact, and, but he made it all possible and opened up doors that I wasn't even aware of to get me in contact with the right people. We went to a little secluded village, which is about 3,700 meters above sea level, where it's so dry and arid. There were nothing really gross besides potatoes. People are very poor there, but very contented. And it made us realize how privileged they are, but also privileged but they also are actually privileged. Um, this was actually in the evening where they waited for us all day for us to come. And when we came there, over 200 people were welcoming us. Um, these people really understood the meaning of community and outreach. As you can see here, these ladies were cooking um, meals for the Sabbath, for Sabbath lunch. They do that every Sabbath because people walk three, four hours to go to church. And they come there on time, and they sleep there, actually. Um, so they always get fed a meal. And I'm not talking about Adventist people. I'm talking about people from the community as well that hear about this. So here they are cooking. You can see their pots there, how big they are. They don't have a kitchen there. There you go. Now, we went to help a little Adventist school there to build bathrooms. Since, as you see from here, um, their bathrooms is just basically a hole in the ground. And we built also a computer science lab. This is where the guys were building the bathrooms, putting in the sewer system. This is the classroom as well. This little school is amazing how they reached out. Um, they really take Mrs. Quote, Mrs. White's quote um, about community to heart. Let me just go back here. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, sorry. This little school grew in one year from 55 students to 200 students. 85% of these kids are non-Adventist. We were so impacted by the love that this little village had shown us. The mayor, for example, who's not a Christian, was so impressed that we were coming and he basically paid for our stay there, for our hotel stay. Um, as I said, they were incredible how they reach out to the community. So like I said, 85% are non-Adventist, but they really reach out to this community and the people of this community really see the value of Adventist Christian education. And as a result, a lot of people are getting baptized there. There's so much I could talk about because of time's sake. Please come and see me afterwards so I can tell you more. We went there to bless them, but instead they blessed us. If you as a church or your youth group is looking to get involved in this type of ministry, this will change you. 
It's such a great opportunity for our young people to experience missions abroad. Don't look at the amount of work to be done, but take the plunge, knowing that God will take care of the rest. Later on, we can talk about also how effectively we planned for the mission and fundraising while still trusting in God. One thing I want to leave with you is this. God has called us for all of us to leave our comfort zones and form meaningful relationships with those around us, whether it be the stranger standing beside us at a grocery store or a neighbor down the street. We don't have to cross the globe to accomplish God's work. We just have to show up and pay attention to the space that he placed us in. He will be faithful in completing the work. The question you might want to ask yourself is this. If your church will disappear tomorrow, will your community miss you? Thank you. Can I just have a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for being in our lives. Father, you are so good to us. And Father, I pray, Father, that you will continue to bless this church. Father, I pray that you will put it uh, upon each and everyone's heart, all of us, Father, that we do your mission. That your mission is, Father, that more people will get to know you. And it's not, it's, it's by forming relationships and having friendships with people outside, Father. So, Father, I pray that you will continue to bless this church in mighty ways and that your Holy Spirit will continue to lead them and guide them. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.